Welcome everyone. My name is Kate Madigan and I'm the director of the Michigan Climate Action Network. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the Digital Climate Action Summit. I want to first of all give a huge thanks to our presenting sponsors, the Groundwork Center for Resilient Communities, Michigan Environmental Council, the Weggy Foundation, Harvest Solar, Eagle, the Fastest Path to Zero at the University of Michigan, the City of Ann Arbor, and the Ecology Center. And I want to thank all of the sponsors of the summit whose logos are behind me on the slideshow. And also thanks to um, Jordan Hamilton, a Kalamazoo-based musician who won the GME for Best Emerging Artist this year, who you saw briefly before we started. And I also want to thank Bill Latka and Allison Costello, who are behind the scenes making all of this happen, and a really great planning team for the summit, who were a wonderful group of people to work with, and our climate leaders from around the state. And also thank you to our panelists who are you're about to hear from. MICAN, or the Michigan Climate Action Network, is a network of 50 organizations and thousands of individuals around the state. And our mission is to build a more powerful movement to elevate climate in our state to be a top priority and to move forward equitable and urgent climate solutions. As you know, because of um, the coronavirus outbreak, we had to cancel the in-person summit in Ann Arbor in March. And we were really looking forward to being together as a network in person. Our state has been hit really hard by the pandemic. And I want to acknowledge the many people who have lost their lives and who have lost loved ones. And I also want to acknowledge those on the front lines in our hospitals, grocery stores, and working to provide essential services, and those who are out of work right now. The coronavirus crisis is the main focus for all of us right now, as it should be. But unfortunately, we are also still in the midst of a climate crisis. And we know that we have to make significant greenhouse gas reductions this decade to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, which will affect us all and will hit environmental justice communities the hardest. So we are working to make sure that as we recover from this COVID-19 crisis, we are rebuilding in a way that addresses the climate crisis and we are building a world that is more just and sustainable for everyone. There's a lot of work happening in this space right now, and this is the topic of our plenary panel today. We have three really incredible thought leaders who will each present, and then we will take questions from the audience. We are then going to have a lightning round of updates from people and organizations leading efforts around the state with a focus on how you can take action. And there are a lot of people on this digital event today, so everyone is currently muted. And below you will see there's a, a Q&A box, and that's where you can type in questions that you'd like me to ask of the panelists. There's also a chat box, and we'd love for you to share comments there. Um, you can include updates. If you didn't sign up to give an update today, you can always share an update there. You can even put links in to the work that you're doing. And we'd love for you to share ideas of issues and speakers that you'd like us to, um, to bring in to future webinars. And finally, we're not finally, almost finally, we are recording this webinar and we will be sharing it on our website later this week. We had a really amazing summit planned back in March, including Governor Whitmer, who was going to be our keynote speaker. We are not going to be able to, or even attempt to recreate all of that digitally today. However, this is the first of many events that we're planning to bring to you to connect you with some of those speakers and provide more networking opportunities. And we are also launching a Climate Solutions podcast series with the Groundwork Center starting on May 20th. So without further ado, I am honored to introduce you to our panelists today. Our first panelist will be Maggie Thomas. She was the Deputy Climate Director for Washington Governor Jay Inslee's presidential campaign. And she then joined Senator Warren's campaign as the Climate Policy Advisor. In those roles, she helped write some of the most ambitious and comprehensive climate plans in the nation. Building on those plans, Maggie and her colleagues recently released the Evergreen Action Plan, a climate action plan to help guide federal action on climate change, including how we rebuild the economy after the coronavirus in ways that are equitable and address the climate crisis. We'll then hear from Regina Strong. She was appointed by Governor Whitmer as the Environmental Justice Public Advocate for the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, or EGLE. Before that, Regina was the Michigan Director for the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal Campaign, and has extensive experience in advocacy and public affairs. And then we'll hear from Frank Houston, who's the Regional Program Manager for Michigan for Blue Green Alliance, a coalition of labor and environmental groups. 
Frank leads their work in Michigan in many areas, including addressing climate change, promoting good manufacturing jobs, and to encourage a just transition for workers and communities as we move to a cleaner economy. So our first speaker will be Maggie Thomas. Welcome, Maggie. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for, uh, for having me. And thank you so much to the Mission Climate Action Network for hosting this event um, and bringing us all together. It's, it's really wonderful um, to be here with you in this uh, digital format. Um, so, you know, as, uh, as Kate was saying, I think um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about sort of the federal policy implications here and how we really can think about a green recovery as we, you know, uh, rebuild from the coronavirus pandemic. Um, you know, we have this moment in time um, and an opportunity with Congress right now to really take some of those early and beginning steps on bold climate action. Um, and engage with the federal process. Um, and so excited to sort of share with you all how, um, how we are thinking about that right now. Um, so what I thought I'd do today is talk a little bit about the Evergreen Action Plan, um, tell you about what it is, um, then talk, go into a little bit more detail about the Action Plan's policy framework, um, which is the framework that we are, are using as we think about federal climate action. Um, and then lastly, um, sort of, tell you a few stories about how, um, you know, my time in Michigan last summer with Governor Jay Inslee and, and Senator Warren um, and, and the trips that we took and, and the folks that we met actually um, informed our plans, our, our presidential um, climate plans. Um, and hopeful, hopefully you'll enjoy um, a, few, a few stories from, from the campaign trail. So um, as was said, um, I served as the deputy climate director for Governor Jay Inslee's presidential campaign and later went on to uh, be a climate policy advisor uh, for Senator Warren. Um, what that job means is uh, very different on any given day. Uh, for Senator Warren's team, you know, I was the only person on the campaign whose job it was to think about climate full time. So that meant, you know, writing climate plans and climate policy, but it also meant approving every single tweet that went out um, that had the word climate in it or had something to do with the environment. So pretty, pretty broad portfolio and uh, a complete honor and an amazing opportunity um, over the last year. And you know, now um, I'm back with uh, the former Inslee climate team working to pull together um, what was just released as the Evergreen Action Plan. Um, the Evergreen Action Plan, believe it or not, is a distilled version of the 218 pages of climate policy that um, was put together by J Governor Jay Inslee. Um, it's 85 pages long, and I tell you, that's the best we could do. So we went from 218 to 85 pages. Um, encourage you all to uh, give it a read if you haven't seen it, um, and happy to send it around afterwards to, to folks as well. Um, you know, the, the way that we really think about um, cli climate policy from the federal level uh, as part of the Evergreen Action Plan and sort of this new, new group that's in formation um, is really threefold. Um, it's starting with investments, focusing on standards, and prioritizing justice. Um, so I'll go into a little bit of detail of those, of those three sections, and I think you will begin to see you know, how this conversation that's going on right now around how we rebuild as a result of coronavirus, you know, how, do we, how do we rebuild from coronavirus while also transitioning to 100% clean energy um, and sort of building that new clean energy future fit together. Um, so on, first with investments, um, you know, we really believe that the federal government should invest trillions of dollars. Um, that is something the federal government can do. It can print money. Um, and, you know, we believe um, at, at Evergreen that, um, that this large scale investment should jumpstart new in industries, excuse me, and not prop up fossil fuel um, economies of the past. Um, you know, we also believe very strongly that these in investments should drive job creation. I think particularly now, as you look at the millions of Americans that are unemployed as a result of, you know, the economic crisis um, from the pandemic, um, you know, we need to be taking the steps right now. Congress needs to be taking the steps right now to actually be able to put people back to work as soon as it's safe to do so. And by creating large scale and by making large scale investments into the new clean energy economy, that's one way to do it. You know, we know it's going to take millions of people um, to rebuild our clean energy, rebuild our, our new clean energy future. 
Um, and we want to make sure that those are good union jobs along the way as well. The second place um, that we, that, you know, that our framework is, um, is this idea of clean energy standards. So, you know, we believe that the federal government should set economy-wide, industry-specific clean energy standards. Um, we know from state-level work that clean energy standards are the policy that drives sustained greenhouse gas reductions at the speed and scale that science demands. Um, other carbon reduction policies are important, absolutely, and they should be part of the suite of solutions. But the crux of our decarbonization plan really needs to start with standards. Um, and, and we also need you know, interim targets that are industry specific. So that means power, that means transportation, that means buildings. Um, you know, just another word about standards here. You know, standards are the mandate. Clean energy standards, I should say, are the mandate. Um, they're the rules of the road that say we are a nation that's committed to X percent of our energy from clean power by X date. Um, it's the edge of the sandbox that says, you know, here's the space that you can build in. And we know that we're going to face all kinds of opposition as we try to pass these at the federal level. Um, and we know that, you know, there's going to be, or there's going to try to be industry influence. Um, and that's exactly why we need strong standards to set the rules of the road from the outset. Um, the last, the last section um, and, and sort of part of our framework from the Evergreen Action Plan um, is this idea of prioritizing justice. So, you know, we have an opportunity to rebuild our economy from the bottom up. And what that means is addressing the legacy of environmental racism in this country. It means, you know, equity and justice specific policies at the federal level. And it means weaving environmental justice into every domestic policy issue the next president and Congress take on. We think that the right place to start is modeling policy after states like California and New York that have made calls for a specific percentage of funds to be spent in frontline communities. 40% um, is what we call for in the Evergreen Action Plan, but we really we can't stop there. You know, we, we need to use federal dollars to invest in real data collection to fully understand the impact that environmental racism has had on a variety of other outcomes and indicators like health, housing, and education. Um, so that's a bit about the Evergreen um, Action fr Policy Framework, and I'm happy to take questions more specifically on that um, during the Q&A. Um, but I also wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about how um, my time in Michigan with Governor Jay Inslee um, as we developed the Community Climate Justice Plan and Senator Warren's Fighting for Justice as we combat the Climate Crisis Plan, um, how my time in Michigan informed those plans. Um, so, you know, the first thing you'll notice is that neither of these plans are called environmental justice plans. Um, and I will give full and 100% credit uh, to the incredible Teresa Landrum of 48217 for that. You know, one of, one of the many things that Teresa impressed upon us um, was that any plan for environmental justice must start and end with community. And any federal action must be led, not just informed by, but led by those communities who are impacted um, first and worst by climate change and industrial pollution. You know, it's also really important for federal lawmakers and advocates to recognize that communities have been dealing with the brunt of environmental racism and that they have some solutions. Um, just because this is a new issue for the federal government doesn't mean that it's new for Flint or Detroit or any other community across the country. So another trip that we took with Governor Jay Inslee uh, was to see Michael Harris at the Flint Development Center, um, where an abandoned elementary school has been transformed into a community center that will host community water level testing and serve as a STEM education opportunity for students to become lab techs. I would bet that federal lawmakers and their staff could spend a lot of time sitting in Washington trying to dream up an idea as good as this one. Um, but, you know, we know that, uh, that, that this, are, this idea has already been conceived of and is being piloted right in Michigan. Um, and that's why we felt so strongly as we developed the Community Climate Justice Plan that the Environmental Justice Council that we called for within the Council on Environmental Quality should be directly reporting to the White House and not just through a federal agency. Um, you know, it's going to take courage and ambition to really right the wrongs of our fossil fuel based economy. And we want to make sure that leaders have access to the highest levels of government, not just to create new programs, but also report back on how those programs are working. So the last thing I'll end with um, is this idea that, 
you know, really was the, the crux of Governor Jay Inslee's, um, the, the thesis of his campaign, which is this idea that good climate policy is good economic policy. You know, if we invest, if we make large scale investments, if we set standards, and if we do it in a just and equitable way, we can defeat the climate crisis and we can create millions of good jobs and build a new just clean energy economy. Um, so with that, I'll end there and look forward to taking some questions. Great, thank you so much, Maggie. Our next speaker is Regina Strong, the Environmental Justice Public Advocate for EGLE. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Maggie, for that great segue into talking about justice and equity and environment, because there's a real intersection there with what you're talking about and what we're working on from the state level. I'm gonna share some slides. Um, anyone who knows me knows technology is not always my strong suit, so let's see how this works. Uh, here we go. Okay, now if I can start the slideshow, I'll be working. Let's see if that works. Perfect. So um, just wanted to start out by talking a little bit about the creation of my role and the Office of Environmental Justice Public Advocate. So it was created in the beginning of Governor Whitmer's term in 2019. It was the sixth executive order, started out as the second, went through some changes and adjustments and, and ultimately became the sixth. And within that executive order, it not only created my position of the Environmental Justice Public Advocate, but also the Office of the Environmental Justice Public Advocate and the Office of Climate and Energy was also created in that same executive order. Um, both offices operate within the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy or EGLE. And we work very collaboratively um, to ensure that the state is moving forward with looking at you know, climate plans and climate impacts through a lens of equity. I also wanted to mention that there's also a clean water public advocate, Nina Sassy. We also work very closely together. Um, it's very interesting to, to Maggie's point about you know, how government looks at issues of, of equity and justice as it relates to environment. Um, I think what's unique about these roles, um, particularly the environmental justice and climate, um, clean water public advocate roles, is that they are meant to be public advocates, which means they work both externally and internally within government to advocate um, for justice and equity. So the focus of all of this is about action and engagement from the state perspective. So. Um, a lot of things either are happening or have happened. So um, one of the things, and you'll hear um, in a moment from Frank Houston, who's a member of our Michigan Advisory Council on Environmental Justice, or the MAC-EJ as I like to call it, um, is the first environmental justice advisory that the state of Michigan has had. And it is a real intentional mix of advocates, frontline folks, community organizations, labor, academia, um, local governments, public health, um, just really looking at things from broad perspectives and making sure that, that we're advising moving forward. So that body was convened in, the, in February. We've had several meetings and, and kind of to the point of where we are now within our last month that felt like a year because April just had so much going on and, and so many um, transitions with the COVID crisis that typically that body has been meeting. The plan was to meet once a month, but once COVID hit, because there were so many things that we wanted to focus on, we've been meeting every two weeks and having conversations and trying to move forward some actions. And the good news about having all the advocates and, and frontline community and everyone at the table is that there are a lot, unfortunately, of, of issues that we have to tackle, but there are a lot of great minds looking at that. So in addition to the um, Advisory Council on Environmental Justice, coming soon will be a climate task force that Dr. Brandy Brown, who is um, runs the Office of Climate and Energy, is putting together, as well as looks at a just transition task force and what that will look like. So I just wanted to share with you guys a, a picture we took at kind of the kickoff of uh, the Michigan Advisory Council on Environmental Justice. So this picture is a combination of 
Um, and Frank, I see you in the picture. This picture is a combination of both Michigan Advisory Council on Environmental Justice members, as well as um, members of the interagency environmental justice response team, which was also created as part of uh, the executive order, which are several state departments all at the table, um, looking to discuss, figure out process, and work forward on issues as they bubble up. And, I, and all of this kind of background, because it's new to Michigan, I wanted to, to kind of ground, you know, um, my comments in the fact that there is action moving forward, but as we all know, there's so much more that we want to be able to do. And so again, with the interagency EJ response team, initially the executive order called for the Department of Natural Resources, Department of Civil Rights, Transportation, Public Service Commission, Economic Development, um, Agricultural and Rural Development, and Health and Human Services. And what we quickly learned when we started meeting um, back in July is there were so many other departments that needed to be at the table. So we invited everyone, every department, and many of them are at the table now. So the table has grown. And I think that's an important piece to really look at how we move forward on environmental justice is really, it is really, although it is grounded in environment, it's much more about equity and justice from a broader scale. Um, and so within that work of the interagency response team, there are four work groups, planning and policy, communications and outreach and research and data and training, looking at some of the important aspects of how we can kind of stem the tide of some of the institutional things that have made it, made justice difficult when it came to equity and environment in Michigan. So I want to step back and talk a little bit about um, COVID-19 as it relates to environmental justice. One of the things that I think Kate talked about this early, earlier is that environmental justice communities have been hit really hard by COVID-19. Um, and so as many of you know, oftentimes environmental justice communities are communities of color, as well as lower income communities that are burdened by a variety of factors, not just environmental factors. And so, you know, there is a real link between um, issues of poverty, issues of challenges that people live with, and COVID-19, and a lot of systemic um, racial barriers, and, you know, disparate treatment, and it is really kind of the, 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 the intersection of things that have been going on for a long time, and you've been hearing about for a long time, and now COVID has put them in stark relief. And so things like water reconnections and communities without water, because how do you protect yourself from a virus that requires you to wash your hands constantly without water? And how does it impact um, you know, communities already burdened with you know, air pollution as it relates to the weakening of systems, the exposure to, to contaminants? You know, Harvard just recently released a study um, and the impact of some of these things. How, how, how did these all connect for communities um, as it relates to COVID-19? So I think there's some real, you know, brought forward by the tragedies we're living through right now, opportunities to address systemic inequities that really have a strong impact on communities. Um, in addition to just kind of as a side um, comment, the, the governor did a couple things related to COVID-19 that I think are relevant for this. And one is the executive order that called for all um, water that is part of a water system that was turned off to be reconnected. So saying to water departments, they must reconnect that water. And that's an important piece moving forward and something that we're monitoring to make sure that that's happening and, and quickly so that folks can protect themselves. Um, in addition, the creation of the Racial Disparities Task Force as it relates to um, the COVID-19 crisis is it, uh, the irony of that for me and the perspective that I'm looking at this from is that these have existed all along, but they're really in stark relief right now. And so I think there's an opportunity to address those. Um, disparate impacts have in, impacted communities 
you know, from everything like I talked about before, you know, whether it's air pollution, whether it's tribal communities who live off the land, whether it's physical infrastructure, which is a lot of our challenges we have now, whether it's looking at cumulative impacts and even the ability to really have meaningful public engagement is impacted by what we're going through right now. So this is just a wheel that looks really busy, but it is really about the interconnectivity of our world, right? So it's all about, you know, economic well-being and education and health and environment and housing and how that is really, those are really intergenerational effects that affect communities. And why that's relevant now, to Maggie's point earlier about policy and process, there is, there is a real interconnectivity and, and impact um, on the policies that are set at the state, federal, and local level, and communities. And that intersection, like that center of the wheel that really talks about structural inequities and, and how those things impact lives is a critical piece of how we move forward now. Um, so I wanted to just step back a little bit and talk about climate. And, um, you know, we have to do our work on climate through an equitable lens. Uh, Kate mentioned earlier that I spent the last several years focused on um, moving us beyond coal, right, as part of the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign and moving us beyond fossil fuels and moving toward clean energy. But I think in that work, what's required is to be intentionally inclusive as we move forward and as we plan. So we have to think about this as equity is how we do what we do how we look at it, not an add-on, not something, oh, we figured this out, now we gotta bring in community to help us, you know, review our plans. No, you know, to the point of some of the amazing mentors that I've had in environmental justice and the amazing advocates and folks I work with now, you have to be part of the solution, not an add-on. And you don't need other people to come and save you or speak for you, you should be able to speak for yourself as the community. So I think that's a critical piece of how we have to move forward in our work together, um, focused on climate, but through that real equity lens. I think that's critical to the work we do moving forward. Um, there's a real intersection of climate and equity and, and we can prioritize both, right? And so, you know, sometimes working for an environmental regulatory agency, you know, the, the mission is about um, protecting the environment, but also about protecting public health. So we can do both. They're not like an either or, um, you know, choice. Really, it has to be integrated. In addition, you have to really think about how do you engage frontline communities in our renewable energy future? For instance, are there jobs that should be trained for? Are there opportunities to cite, you know, renewable options in communities that once had brownfields, right? Like, so how do you move from that industrial past? You know, the one thing that our industrial, I guess, part of the present and part of the past leaves behind is sites. There are sites, there are buildings. What happens on those sites that can move communities forward? So where's the opportunity to uplift those communities, create jobs, transition to economically viable communities? I think there's a real opportunity as we move forward on climate to figure those things out. And as we prioritize things like electrification, of, you know, we can't just think about personal vehicles and electric cars, which are amazing, but we also have to think about public transportation and the ways that people can avail themselves of things that aren't based on fossil fuels in communities that already are living um, in situations where just surviving day to day is a big part of their daily lives. And so, you know, this is just kind of a, a reiteration of some of what I've said, but I mean, I think things like being able to assess cumulative impact so we can have mitigation strategies, we can look at, you know, how we help those overburdened communities not be so overburdened and, and look at ways to move forward, um, as well as providing opportunities for not just engagement, but involvement and a seat at the table when decisions are being made and not just a seat, but actually engagement in the process. So, um, you know, I, I think that is a big part of what my office tries to do in consort with the rest of the state. You know, it's, it's, it's a very, I think we're at an opportune moment in our future as we move beyond our COVID reality, I think the focus is really about 
getting us to that next level. And I think clearing the slate has given us an opportunity to really look at some things that, and some hard truths that some people maybe haven't been paying attention to, but, it, but they see it now. And so what do we do next? And I think for, you know, for me, from the role of environmental justice public advocate, there is a real connectivity between what happens for communities, what happens for jobs, what happens in policy. I think we have to connect those dots. So I think that's it. Um, there's probably more I could say on and on and on. I have a time limit. I haven't gotten the hook yet, but I know it's coming. I'm sure it's been longer than 10 minutes. So I want to transition and thank you all. I'll be happy to answer questions um, once we're done with Frank's presentation. Great, thank you so much, Regina. And I think you were right on time. That was excellent. Um, so next up, we have Frank Houston, the Regional Program Manager for Michigan for the Blue Green Alliance. Thanks, Kate. And uh, happy Cinco de Mayo, everybody. And, and thanks, Kate, for, for all the work you and the MyCan team did to, to keep pushing this all forward. And, uh, challenging time of crisis, right? Uh, so I, I think Maggie and Regina uh, hit on a lot of things that I'm gonna cover a little bit more on, but um, but just to begin, let me share my screen. I do have a little PowerPoint I'm gonna go through. Uh, where did my screen share go? Where's my PowerPoint? And let's see, put this on. Hold it one second, folks. All right, I'm hoping that's good. If it's not, someone give me a big thumbs down if you're not seeing the PowerPoint. Yeah. So uh, once again, I am with the Blue Green Alliance. Uh, for those who don't know us, we are an organization that is uh, really comprised of some of the largest national environmental groups, um, uh, uh, national labor and environmental groups in the country, uh, ranging from folks like the Sierra Club and League of Conservation Voters, National Resources Defense Council, uh, several other environmental groups, as well as on the labor side. Uh, some of the biggest unions like the United Steel Workers, uh, AFT, uh, sheet metal workers, you name it. Um, so we're, we're a pretty broad umbrella group of folks who are all committed to taking on the biggest environmental challenges of the day and doing so in a way that fights for kind of fairness in the economy uh, as well. So when we talk about, so I'm trying to hide this little thing right here. Ah, there we go. Um, so we generally think about but before COVID, there was really two borderline existential crises we were already dealing with. One being obviously climate and the, the, all the challenges that come with climate change and the other being the growing levels of economic inequality that are really just destroying not just our country and our world. Um, so I don't think I need to spend a lot on these slides on climate for this group, but obviously when you're talking about you know, it's potentially reaching uh, four degrees Celsius increase in, by the end of this century. And the way that's gonna impact not just my children, my grandchildren, but everyone across the world. It's, this is, there probably is no greater crisis, uh, despite what COVID is challenging us with today. Um, and, and I think we as an organization, and that includes our labor partners as well as our environmental ones, really have zoned in on using science so looking at you know, those tipping point moments that we've all heard a lot about and how can we make sure that we're addressing climate adequately on the benchmarks that have been laid out by so many others, including that major date of 2050 and by then. Um, and there's other steps along the way we all as an organization agree on in terms of you know, signing back. Moving on to economic inequality, I, I'm just gonna zone very quickly on the fact some facts that we all know, which is CO pay has gone way up, uh, labor uh, union membership has gone way down, and that leads to a lot of systemic breakdowns that I think the COVID crisis has just made more evident uh, that Regina hit on. The reality is, you know, when you look at, you know, the, the impacts on people of color in Michigan and with COVID as well as across the country, it's the same sort of things we see in economic justice and environmental justice issues. And that's why it's so important when we think about the fact that, you know, when, if you're African-American and you're in a union, you're making 27% more on average. If you're, a, if you're a Latino American, you're making 40% more if you're in a union. You know, these are real issues that cut across. And it, it, so I think bottom line is we know that unions often are, you know, fighting for the most important workforce protections and basic levels of fairness and respect in the economy. Um, but as we take on climate change, as we take on the COVID crisis, 
it's important that we don't forget all the challenges that income inequality and um, really the, the destruction of our economy for a shrinking percent of people's benefit is intertwined with all these issues. Uh, moving along, so bottom line as an organization, our vision is to, and I'm sorry if my screen here is still showing the, the sidebar here, I'm trying to get rid of it. Um, sorry about that. So we, our vision really is simply put to stop seeing, to stop this false narrative that you have to choose between climate change and environmental issues and public health or providing good jobs and fairness in the economy for, for the largest majority of people possible. Uh, we know that's a false narrative and we challenge it every day through our work with our partners. Um, but I want to touch on a little bit of how we got the, some of the conclusions I'm going to get into with on climate and where we go. Uh, after the 2000 election, we led a deep research project called the Midwest Initiative, where we looked at those swing voters who voted for Trump, uh, but aren't hardcore right-wing Republican voters or inherently racist. Um, and what we found was there was a whole set of people, when we challenged them on issues around climate, around energy, and around, um, you know, basically how they see these issues moving forward as it affects the economy. Being, there were some things we got. And what they are, simply put, were that, you know, when you ask people about energy issues, environmental issues, climate change, the first thing that comes to mind for swing voters is the economy and jobs, and just bottom line. And that's what really is driving their voting patterns. There, there are several other things that we can get into. There was a lot of concern about how issues of climate and environment intertwine with public health and it's in their, the impact on their own family. Um, there was also, I think, a lot of frustration that they didn't feel like the government and politicians were adequately able to take on complicated policies like the future uh, issues around climate change and, and do it in a way that was responsible. But I think the overall theme that, that we saw is that, I think across the board, people believe the new quote unquote clean economy and renewable energy, all these things were now here and they're real and they're happening. They just didn't believe that they, these workers didn't believe they were gonna benefit from it. So regardless if it was a UAW worker from Southgate or a steel worker from Sterling Heights, there was a true belief that when, they, when they, we talk about climate change and opportunities for a cleaner economy, their, most inter their interests really were related to public health, you know, their kids with asthma, um, the ability to have affordable renewable energy that's not going to run out, that's a stable source. Those things were believable to them, but they don't vote based on that. They vote based on jobs, and they just didn't believe they, they were going to get those jobs. I say that just to say the delay a, a backdrop of it's so important that when we're talking about really building solidarity for climate action, which is what our platform is called, that we are not forgetting any community or any worker along the way, and that we make sure that we're really addressing all these issues systemically together. Um, so our, our basic principles for climate action, make sure that we are acting on this now and getting to climate stability, uh, making sure that we really are creating and retaining good quality jobs. Uh, too often, the trick is that when people think of renewable energy jobs, they're thinking of low-end jobs. Those level solar installers on roofs who are making just above minimum wage. And the reality is we actually need to be making a case for there are great opportunities out there in the renewable energy sector, but only if we really are tethering good labor policies and make sure people are, are having high road jobs coming out of transitions to new technologies and new sectors in, in energy. Um, we also really are I mean, I think it's fundamental, but we understand that communities as well as workplaces need clean air, clean water, uh, you know, and that this is a right. This, we believe that this is a fundamental right. Uh, we're making sure we're investing heavily in community resilience. The, the governor's budget was a good first step in Michigan, although I think we all would agree we need a lot more. And we also need to be investing heavily in infrastructure, which I don't know if I'll get to through these slides, but I'm going to try to. We could create hundreds of thousands of jobs just here in Michigan, probably about 116, 117,000 that would be uh, lasting for years uh, if we just simply invested in infrastructure, get ourselves from a D plus grade to a B grade as others would rate us. Um, and we also believe we need to be investing heavily in American manufacturing and retooling industry. 
the technology is there and the benefit is there for our auto industry, for instance, by electric vehicles and strong fuel economy standards, the failure to do so will leave us behind as well as miss an opportunity to really take on the climate crisis. And as Regina was, was hitting, we need to make sure no communities are left behind. And that, you know, and I think the reality is the challenges the environmental communities had, and I think all of us have struggled with, with making sure that no community is left behind uh, when we talk about environmental justice issues. It's the same challenges that the unions have faced with making sure workers aren't left behind. And I think the solution for both is to make sure that we are including frontline workers, frontline community members in the conversation and the decision making for the best policies we can, we can move uh, these issues forward. So uh, with that, I, I just hit on that the plan that we've put out, uh, which I'll include a link to on, on the chat function in a minute, is really a solidarity step is unprecedented between the environmental and labor community. There has never been this aggressive of a plan to take on climate change that's ever been put out with such a broad range of labor stakeholders 100 to signing on. So although we recognize that some environmental and labor partners might take steps stronger than this, and some communities actually should be doing more now, we believe that what we lay out in this, uh, this plan is is something that there's 100% consensus from our labor environmental partners is something we do. There's no argument about it. Um, so we center a lot of this around um, net zero, which I think people have heard about. Specifically, uh, we believe that you have to get the net zero by 2050. Um, that doesn't mean we have to prescribe what technologies are used to get there, but we do believe net zero by 2050 is the number one thing that we can get everyone on board with and treat as an organizing principle and policies. I'm almost up in time, so I'm going to go really quick. Um, I'm going to fast forward here uh, just to give a few other things. When we were talking about rebuilding America, it's important on infrastructure that we're really making broad investments, that we're reducing pollution along the way, we're ensuring that we're creating good paying jobs, and we're really making sure all benefit, uh, communities benefit, much as Maggie hit on earlier, the idea of having you know, 40% of those earmarked for the most uh, traditionally underrepresented communities when it comes to these jobs. And I'm sorry I'm not going to get through the rest of these slides. I will share. Um, but the last thing I just want to hit on is we also put out some COVID principles that we're, we're encouraging our federal and state legislators to look at, including that the number one thing is we need to make sure that all people and families are safe and their immediate needs are being met. And that includes protecting public health and safety of all frontline workers, that we're uh, making sure critical equipment and supplies are getting out there now and that workers are part of this decision making and the safety processes and that we we really do need to ensure that you know community and health and safety are supported properly through any future stimulus dollars so with that i know i'm over time my apologies i will share more in the chat thanks Great. Thank you so much, Frank. And thank you for saying that you'll share your slides. There have been some requests in the chat box for the slides and I see Regina nodding too. So we'll get those out to everyone. And again, we will be, sh we will be sharing the recording of this as well. Um, so let's give a, a digital virtual round of applause to our panelists. Thank you all so much. Um, we already have several questions lined up. So let's just jump right into these questions. Um, this first one is from Julie Roth and it's for Maggie. Has the Biden campaign requested and or responded to the Evergreen Action Plan? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, we did share it with the Biden campaign. Um, and I think that, um, you know, uh, the vice president has said in the last week or so, um, particular in his, particularly in his conversation with Governor Jay Inslee, um, that was released as part of the No Malarkey podcast, which I highly recommend you all take a listen to, um, that, you know, the campaign, his campaign would be doing more on climate, particularly in the areas of um, environmental justice, um, as well as thinking through sort of a potentially um, something around standards and investment. So, um, yes, we are, we are working with them. Great. Thank you, Maggie. Um, here's a question for Regina. Who is representing agriculture on the interagency environmental justice team? Okay, let me get off mute. Okay, 
So it's Director McDowell, so the director of the department. For all of the departments, um, it is meant to be the director of the department, although they bring other folks to the table. So, you know, for instance, um, the chair of the uh, Michigan Public Service Commission, Sally Talbert, is part of the team. Same with, you know, DNR, transportation, all of the directors are part of the team and often others within um, the department participate as well. Great, thank you. Um, this question is from, uh, I'm skipping around to try to share these questions with this, the presenters. This question is from Dan Worth. This is for you. We'll start with you, Frank. How can we best transition folks from fossil fuel jobs to clean energy careers coming out of COVID, especially in Mich Michigan? Specifically, please, thanks. I, I mean, I think there's a couple common sense steps. I mean, the first thing is to really I think be making sure we have aggressive standards and policies in place that create the environment um, to make sure that we, that there's jobs need for those for those industries to be supported. Um, so an example of this that was very effective is when President Obama was elected and they passed some of the strongest fuel economy standards in the history of our country. And the reality is that created over seventy thousand jobs in Michigan and saved uh, in many ways the, the the domestic auto industry. So I think some of it is the policies we put in place and the standards we set. But I think also it's making sure that when every opportunity we have to push, for instance, a new re renewable energy uh, project or any other technology that, that really is taking on climate change, that we're looking at you know, what are those policies in there where we can make them just a little better for workers, a little safer, a little bit uh, more making sure that they have things like you know, quality paid sick days and, and they can live off the pay they're making. Um, and, and really, we have to be able to uh, document and show success stories. So, for instance, when in, in downriver, when the coal fire project down there in Trenton and Rouge closed, we need to make sure that those are real success stories and that the workers there have jobs coming out of it in other sectors of the economy or are able to be relocated to other, other plants, and that the communities there uh, are still able to maintain their tax base without those traditional big, you know, big foot power plants. Um, you know, it's not a success story if you lose your school system. So I think a lot of it is having real participation from frontline community members and from workers in the decision making. So that way, when we're designing training and policy, it really meets their needs. Sorry, that's a very long winded start. Of it. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions about the Green New Deal. Um, one in particular, can Maggie and Frank compare their respective plans with the principles of the Green New Deal? That's from Anne Wywoody. Jeff Allison asks, um, similarly, can speakers address how they see their work vis-a-vis -vis the Green New Deal? Yeah, I'm happy to start um, and then turn it over to others. You know, um, the way that I, I think about the Green New Deal um, is it's really a framework um, and on, on the presidential campaigns, we like to say that our job was to fill in the green new details. Um, and so that I think is part of what we're trying to do here with the Evergreen Action Plan. You know, the Green New Deal was um, hugely transformational in uh, asking the American public and legislators, you know, particularly Congress, to think about this idea of how do we simultaneously address income inequality alongside defeating the climate crisis. And I think that's the spirit with which, you know, all of the policies that, that are included in the Evergreen Action Plan um, uh, are approached with. Um, so very much in line with the Green New Deal, um, but the, the goal is really to put just a few more details around it. So I'll jump in. So I, I think what Maggie hit on is right, which is a real huge step that I think we're all glad to see in the Green New Deal is that um, they did bring up the need to, to tackle income inequality. I think that the difference in approach from our what our, our group has done so far is just, it's honestly, it's just been very slow and incremental. We had 20 some versions probably of our climate plan that we put out. Um, and the goals are a little more modest. So, I mean, it's not as aggressive by 2030. We left a little bit more open-ended on a shorter timeline. And we tried to take the, the longer-term benchmark of 2050 as the, the thing that we really centered around. Um, the other thing is what we, we try to do is not limit ourselves to specific technologies as much, which sometimes can become 
example. But in, in, in order to both include all of our labor partners and, and allow for other technologies that could emerge, we try to leave open things like carbon capture and other things that maybe isn't everyone's first choice for how we get to net zero and, and definitely won't be some sort of silver bullet to get us there, but might be part of what happens, like you said, in steps along the way. So I think what we try to do is just have as, as an inclusive of a process as possible with a broad set of folks who frankly have a lot to iron out to sign off on this. And, and, and that consensus building, we think, made a better plan. Um, even if it leaves, I think, the need still for local government, state government, et cetera, to be thinking about you know, what are those incremental steps and how do you set some standards by sector or some other things that we just didn't resolve in this first draft. That's, but I think it's been an important conversation starter and we, we definitely appreciate all the work uh, Sunrise and others have done on it. Thank you. Uh, this question is from Christian Noyce and I think it's for you, Regina. How is the state of Michigan monitoring local water departments to make sure they are turning water back on? Okay, um, that's a good question. And we are, last week, I think it was last weekend, was the first reporting um, from local water departments of the homes that have been turned on to date, like the number. Um, there's another reporting deadline coming up. We also are working to make sure that um, you know, the data is posted on the Eagle website, as well as several local departments are posting that information on their websites. And then we're following up and there is a way um, that if there's a chat, there's a issue or question for someone who's trying to get their water turned back on, um, they can reach out to the Eagle 800 number or email Eagle and those are monitored by Nana Sassy, who's our clean water advocate and that's our way of trying to follow up for folks who um, may be having challenges in the process. I mean, the, in some communities, you know, for instance, in the city of Detroit, there are a huge number of folks um, to be turned on. And so we're, we're looking closely at, at making sure because the executive order pretty much says in um, any occupied residence without running water should have it turned back on. And that is, you know, in some communities, it may only be a few and in other communities, it could be thousands. So it's really um, trying to also make sure that, that that work is moving forward as quickly as it can. And then money was provided and there are opportunities for local water systems to get grants if funding is an issue as it relates to turning on the number of folks who need to be reconnected. Thank you. Here's a fun question, I think, from Misty Stoltz. If you could wave a magic wand and make one change, just one, that you think would dem demonstrably move us towards a just, sustainable, and resilient future, what would it be? So who wants to start? <laughs> I'll, I'll say anything. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Maggie. Um, this is a really hard question. Uh, <laughs> I would say that the federal government should use the Evergreen Action Policy Framework so that we get all three investment standards in justice. I don't know if that's cheating. <laughs> I was going to cheat too and say they should adopt our, our solidarity plan for climate action at Blue Green Alliance. But I think the very least, the federal government recognizing that it's got, we got to go all in to make sure we're at net zero by 2050. And we do so in a way that really prioritizes everyone benefiting from that um, in making sure frontline workers and uh, communities that have traditionally been left behind, particularly communities of color, are part of the discussion of how that policy develops. And I think I, if I could wave a magic wand, I would um, kind of cure all the systemic inequities and um, institutional racism that's created all the barriers to us moving forward, as well as, this is like a two part, if I could wave a magic wand, you know, you get three wishes, so I'm adding on to it. But in addition to that, um, kind of change the hearts and minds of any folks that are blocking things that would move us forward on either of those, as well as, you know, policy that's really gonna save our, our planet. 
you. Oh, there are so many questions. Um, here's another for you, Regina. So many good questions. Um, this is from Beryl Scrocky, who's a founding member of the Great Lakes Business Network. And um, she writes, can you tell us when Governor Whitmer, who was supposed to speak at the summit in March, when she will announce through executive action her plan for Michigan to meet the greenhouse gas reductions described by climate scientists to address climate change? So I can't tell you exactly when. I do know um, a lot of the work in preparation for that continues as the governor is very focused on our COVID response and very focused on saving lives in Michigan. So I can't give you an exact date, but I will say that um, it maintains its level of priority with the administration. I think there are just so many things going on right now. Who knows when it'll actually be, um, hopefully as we move past some of the more urgent and emergency-based pieces of responding to um, the impact on lives of Michiganders of the COVID crisis that we then can move forward. If you've noticed, that's kind of been the main focus of the administration right now, and I think that will continue for a while. Um, so although I know it's a priority and I wish I could tell you an exact time, I really don't have a, a sense of that yet. Okay. Great. I think we have time for just one more question before we move on to the next part of our agenda. Um, this one is from Kimmy Spring. She says, our group is focusing especially on the local level and the state level. What are some of the most effective actions that we can, can be taken on the local level? I would like to, yeah. So, oh, go ahead, Frank. No, no, go ahead, Richard. <laughs> I like how you just give it up so easily. Like, go ahead. No. no uh, so, one of the things that I would say, I mean, I, 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 it's in my it's in my title, but it's also part of who I am and what I do is advocating for these things and being very connected to what your local government is doing in terms of both centering equity and how they look at it and moving forward to do things that are going to help move, um, you know, move us toward our kind of clean energy future. You know, a lot of local um, governments maybe don't know where to start, right? So being that resource, being that voice, that, that collaborative voice that says, I can work with you and help you if you don't know how. So I think those are the ways. And then in terms of training and jobs, I'll let Frank address that. But I think um, ensuring that, that the ground is laid for worker training moving forward as it relates to um, climate is huge and that it is accessible by all who live in that community. So it's not just, you know, cherry picked for a few folks. So that would be my thought on that. Thanks. So, uh, I think, and it's a tough question because I think every community is unique. And the first thing is this acknowledging that the issues that are going to be most salient and the ways we talk about it sometimes are going to vary community to community. But I think one general rule that I really encourage everyone work at the local level to keep in mind is the same thing we tell people in DC they need to do or in other states, and sorry, my kids are trying to come into the room now. Um, and that, that we really need to make sure that uh, the language we use and the, and the tactics we use, we have to understand that reflects on our issues more broadly. So, you know, there's always gonna be a need to have different extremes uh, pushing and advocating for issues, but we have to be respectful of each other and we have to be inclusive and I think we have to organize in a way where we don't start off in silos. So when we have a good idea that, or an important policy or a tough conversation to have, we need to be inclusive right from the get all the people who need to be at that table. And I think that's, and that's more of a strategic approach maybe than a, a policy. But I think that's su such an important thing, especially today when we look, I think the COVID crisis has really taught us that we're almost in a world today where I think how blatantly we've been choosing between people and communities and um, our value sets often, and it's, it's a false choice. And the only way we can take that on is by really working together and remembering that we're all in this together. Great, thank you. I'm just gonna add one thing is that we at the Michigan Climate Action Network, there are a lot of groups um, that have done local actions for 100% renewable energy goals. Um, and that's something that I've done as well. And so I think local action is really important and um, making sure, you know, and there's so much opportunity at the local level to build momentum in our state. 
um, for more for more action, more ambitious and just climate climate policies. Um, so as we close it out, I want to give each of our panelists an opportunity to share la any last closing thoughts. Yeah, I'll, I can go first. Um, I didn't prepare these despite definitely being told that we were going to say this. So this is fully off the cuff. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I like I like I sort of said at, at the end of my comments. Um, you know, I think that we need to really we we need our our legislators and our our federal representatives to really understand how good climate policy is good economic policy. And those two things are one in the same when we think about, you know, defeating the climate crisis and rebuilding a new clean energy economy. And, you know, um, I think that we as, as citizens and as individuals and all those who work in the advocacy community really have almost a responsibility to be very vocal with our representatives to let them know that now is the time that we are demanding, you know, good climate policy and good economic policy. You know, I think we, there are a lot of members on the Hill and I'm hearing that are excited about, um, you know, taking action on climate. Um, and, and we need to give them that positive reinforcement and let them know that, that now is the time, you know, we don't, we don't want to wait, that, that now is the time to really make that bold transformational change that um, we want to see. Thank you. Franco Regina. So I, I agree with pretty much everything Maggie said, and I think we have to be the catalyst for change, right? So we have to push for um, where we go from here. I think what we've learned in, in this very tragic current situation that we're in is that issues are more interconnected than we've ever thought that they were. And regardless to who tries to paint a different picture, I think we all know we need each other in the fight, right? So we have to work together to, Frank made a really good point about where we start um, and who we include when we start. And I, and I totally agree with that. Um, you know, what, we've, what a pandemic has brought um, is also what a huge climate event could bring to environmental justice communities, you know, tribal communities, communities um, who are at a disadvantage from some way. And so really what we've seen is that the people who get caught in these kind of crises are the ones who are already suffering the most. And so prioritizing justice and looking at what are the systemic reasons? Because you can have your own personal opinion, but policy should not follow that, right? So we should have policies and we should have government practices that um, make things easier and more equitable for people and not put them at a disadvantage. And we historically have um, built a whole system of processes that make it super easy to um, impact certain people unintentionally. And so my thought would be is that we continue to push. I mean, those of you who've heard me speak before, I talk a lot about kind of the continuum of change. And I've always believed that starts with being able to agitate that moves to advocacy where you actually have a plan and a thought of what it is you need to change and who can give it to you. And then you get to the negotiation. So I would echo that and just say, that's the important piece of how we move forward is that different people play those different roles, but we have to continue to do that um, because COVID has restarted the clock and we have to remember that and do things differently. So those will be my last comments. Thank you. Frank, any quick last ones? My quick one would be the interconnectedness includes our democracy and we need to make sure that this election is protected and that our decision makers are hearing us around the need to address both systemic inequality and, and the needs of workers and communities as well as address climate change. So, you know, use social media to keep this in the news right now. Uh, I, I think we need to make sure we're not capitalizing on the COVID crisis but just acknowledging the fundamental facts that we're gonna to have to kickstart our economy afterwards and a great that is with all these infrastructure and long overdue uh, energy needs that, that now is right before us. So don't forget to vote, get people to vote and get ready to protect this election because I'm a little nervous about it. That in a very C3 way. 
Great job. That was an excellent point. Thank you all so much. Um, we are now going to move into our lightning round of updates. Um, I'm also going to launch a poll. Um, and so it would be great if, if all of you um, could take a moment to take this poll and um, we will share the results once it's, um, once we have them. Um, so next we are going to um, hear from um, a number of leaders around our state who are going to give updates on efforts going on that they're leading and ways that you can take action. Most of these speakers were also part, part of the planning team for the summit. So a huge thanks to them for all they do. Um, so all of you who are getting ready to speak, Bill is making you um, presenters right now. And so I'm gonna introduce the first speaker and the one and the person who's on deck. So first speaker sharing an update is Justin Onwenu, the Environmental Justice Organizer at Sierra Club. And on deck is Missy Stoltz, the Sustainability and Innovations Manager for the City of Ann Arbor. Great, thanks, thanks for having me. And this was a wonderful webinar, so thanks for hosting. Uh, the one update that I wanna make sure to emphasize is that there's a lot of action going around the state on climate, but also as Frank alluded to, as Regina alluded to, we need to be uh, making sure that we're interconnected in the work that we're doing. So the My COVID Community Coalition, which is comprised of groups who are focused on education, water issues, democracy issues, climate, um, and, and, and healthcare, and paid leave issues, are all working together to push what we're calling a just COVID response. So if you go to mycovid, micovidcommunity.com, you can see the policy demands that we've come up with, you can take action, and if you're an organization or an individual who'd like to sign on, that's welcome as well. So I'll put that in the chat. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you, Justin. Next, we have Missy Stoltz with the City of Ann Arbor. And on deck is Nana Agrawal Hardin, the Hub Coordinator at Sunrise Ann Arbor. Oh, thanks so much, Kate. And great job, everybody. I'm excited to be with you all for a few minutes here. Uh, some updates that we've got from the City of Ann Arbor. You may have heard we have unveiled a plan to uh, transition, a just transition to carbon neutrality community-wide by the year 2030. We continue to work on that, uh, move that forward. And some of the opportunities, we, we welcome feedback on it, all elements of that work for sure. Um, we also are really focused on embracing kind of our youth movement locally. And so we are launching a youth ambassador and a neighborhood ambassador program and would welcome ideas and expertise we have from around the nation. And I would just add that all of our work really is centered um, around three things. One is how we mitigate and reduce the contribution we have towards climate change, how we adapt to the impacts of climate change that are already here, and then also how equity really is uh, the foundation from which all of that works. So I'm excited to continue to push and really work with all the coalitions that are here and all of you that are activists to make sure that we do actually achieve a just transition, which is what we need. So thank you. Thank you so much, Missy. Next up, we have Nana Agrawal Hardin, and on deck is Bentley Johnson. Hi, everybody. Um, wow, it's such an honor to be here. I, to our three panelists, like Frank, labor, um, labor climate stuff has been long been like one of the things that I've been most interested in. Um, as I've, yeah, I'm a high school student, so as I've like started to think about this whole environmental justice thing, um, frontline communities, Regina, that you're representing here are. I just like, wow, people of Detroit, people of Flint, um, so inspiring to me. And Maggie, I've been following you on Twitter forever. You're like, you know, my icon for climate policy and it's just awesome to be here um, with all of you. Like, uh, like was said, I am a hub coordinator at Sunrise Ann Arbor and I also work with Sunrise nationally. Um, and I'd say most of what we're doing right now is centered around a just and green COVID response. Um, so at the local level, that's looking like, um, you know, some dialogue with Congresswoman Debbie Dingell about how we can protect our, my congressional district um, as, as we move through this crisis and, and do so in a way that's sustainable. Um, nationally, Sunrise is working on initiatives like the People's Bailout in Congress. And also we're running a massive online trainings program called Sunrise School. Um, we've already trained thousands of young leaders uh, on everything from like the basics of the Green New Deal to social movement history. Um, and I'd say mainly we're taking this time to, to build our base and also to strengthen our partnerships with labor and environmental justice communities all over the country um, as we prepare to 
you know, rebuild society from this crisis to be more rooted in sustainability and justice. Um, personally, I've been really inspired by how Sunrise has adapted so quickly to our new normal um, and really pivoted towards fighting for a just COVID relief that, you know, stimulates the economy, creates jobs and takes care of frontline communities. Um, this work isn't easy. We've lost a lot of our funding for the year because of this pandemic, and we're relying on grassroots donations now more than ever. So um, today's Giving Tuesday, we're running a big national campaign to reach 500 new monthly donors by the end of the day. Um, if you have financial stability right now and you want to donate, you can donate any amount um, at smovement.org slash giving Tuesday and maybe we can drop that link later on. Um, otherwise, a really great way to engage is to sign up for Sunrise School and um, get educated by, you know, myself and other facilitators about the work that we're doing and the foundations of, of that work. Um, and, and ask, you know, the young people in your lives to do the same and all of that can be accessed on Sunrise's website. Um, yeah, and thank you all so much for your continued work in these really, really tough times. And I really hope to meet and work with a lot of you when we're on the other side of this. Thank you so much, Nina. And please do drop that link in the chat box. Um, next up, we have Emily Johnson, Senior Partnership Manager at Michigan League of Conservation Motors. And on deck is Charlotte Jameson. Thank you. And, um, uh, yeah, thank you, Kate. And I'm right down the street, actually, from Charlotte. We we actually live on the same street, and uh, I've we've I've got uh, our U.S. representative Debbie Dingle in my virtual background there. But I wanted to uh, talk to you about why is Canada education imp important, and why should you do it? First of all, great questions. Thanks for asking. And secondly, um, in short, elections matter, and I'm just going to assume that you agree with me on that point. But um, really, it's easier to elect informed candidates uh, that share, you know, these values than try to educate and persuade lawmakers after they've been elected. That's important, too, but it's just a lot easier up front. And it's a really a chance to build a relationship, common ground, um, you know, on policy, tone, and even just a personal level. And a lot of times you can walk away with, you know, a candidate's cell phone number and keep in touch, you know, just at a personal level. I mean, especially at a state uh, level, it's surprising how easy it is to um, actually get access to candidates and even incumbents uh, to discuss important issues to you. Um, you know, and meeting with them before they get to Lansing um, and their views are hardened is, is really key. You know, right off the bat, um, when uh, new lawmakers come to Lansing, they're just swarmed by interest groups and it's really easy to get lost in the shuffle. Um, not as many groups take the time to do that candidate education. So it makes you, it makes you stand out. And um, you can introduce your own organization if you're volunteering with the organization or if you're staff or, or whatever, um, if you're a supporter. And uh, that's just, you know, arguably just as important as educating the candidate and listening to the candidate talk about what they uh, what, about their values and their priorities is more important than all of that. Um, with COVID, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to do a lot of this in-person stuff, but we're realizing that there's amazing opportunities to do candidate education in new ways. For instance, we can do Zoom calls so we can get across the entire state uh, without driving so we don't have to, you know, uh, we can reduce our own carbon footprint. And we can even do candidate education like in groups, multiple candidates at the same time, or multiple groups partnering together or multiple people partnering together to talk to candidates. So it's, a, it's actually one of those silver linings where we can huge opportunities. Um, and, I, and finally, I would just note that these, these issues of climate policy and uh, clean energy policy can, can seem really intimidating and complicated. Um, but when you have a chance to talk to someone one-on-one, -on -one, break it down. And there's a lot of tools and tips and practices that different groups have honed over the, over the years. Um, it makes it really uh, more approachable and, and resonate at, a, at really a local level. So I know Michigan LCV would love your partnership on candidate education. There's a number of other groups here on this call that do it. C3 groups can educate candidates on issues and that's legally permissible. So if you'd love to um, do some of this work together, um, let me know. My email is Bentley, B-E-N-T-L-E-Y, at michiganlcv.org. I'll put you in touch with our great government affairs team, Nick Acapenti and Joe Fedewa, 
And uh, you can also follow up with Michigan Climate Action Network and that they can share uh, opportunities as well. Thanks. Thank you. Next up, we have Charlotte Jamison, Program Director of Legislative Affairs, Energy and Drinking Water Policy at Michigan Environmental Council. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me here today. Um, and I'm going to talk quickly, just give an overview of some things that are going on in the legislature right now um, so that you guys have a sense of what's out there, what's possible in terms of uh, clean energy policy um, and climate, pro-climate policy in Michigan. The first thing I wanted to highlight is obviously with COVID, um, our state budget is facing um, huge shortfalls. Um, we're seeing huge declines in terms of tax revenue coming into the state. And so the first big hurdle that we're going to now have to face is steep budget cuts on the state level um, and the local level um, this year, and then also reduced budgets into next year. And so I think there's going to need to be a lot of work done to help kind of protect really critical environmental um, and clean energy programs at the state level and to make sure that they don't lose funding. Um, the other side of the advocacy coin is really working um, with our partners on the federal level to make sure that we're getting um, federal revenue to backfill some of that lost state and local tax revenue. That's going to be really critical. Um, so the next few months here in the legislature um, will be taken up a lot with that with that work. There are several, however, bills and bill packages that I think are um, really important and, and do stand a chance of getting some movement. The first one um, is called the Powering Michigan Forward Bill Package, and it's around um, small scale solar and distributed generation. It's a bipartisan bill package, um, Senate bills and House bills. It got a number of uh, committee hearings on the Senate side before the coronavirus lockdown happened, but we're relatively um, uh, hopeful that uh, when things when committee hearings start sort of picking back up again, that we can get those bills back on the agenda and get them out of committee. Um, the, that, the bill package would create a fair value tariff program for small scale solar and for distributed generation so that um, you know, homeowners and others, um, multifam folks who live in multifamily units, um, can get the correct credit on their bill for all the benefits that they provide to the grid by installing uh, solar on their homes and on their residencies. The other piece of that bill package is lifting uh, an arbitrary cap that we have in Michigan on um, the, the amount of small scale solar and distributed generation that we can um, have here. And so that was a cap that was set in place in 2008 and hasn't since been revisited and we are um, nearing the cap in consumers energies territory we already hit the cap um, in uh, a territory up in the upper peninsula um, and we're headed in that direction in dte's territory as well and so it's really an arbitrary barrier on the growth of that industry that we need to do away with so that's one really important bill package um, the other, another really important bill package around electric vehicles, um, also a bipartisan bill package. Um, this bill package would create a um, council on electric vehicles to really look at how we as a state can transition to electric vehicles, build out a statewide charging infrastructure. Um, another bill in that package would allow um, charging stations to go in at state park and rides. Um, another bill would allow charging stations at state parks so that people can, you know, go up north when we're back to being able to do that um, and be able to charge and not fear um, range anxiety. And finally, the third or the fourth bill in that package would provide a tax incentive for small businesses and multi unit um, housing uh, dwellings to be able to install electric vehicle charging because um, it's pretty cost prohibitive and those are the sectors that we see need a little extra help um, when it comes to charging costs. Finally, the, the other bill I want to highlight is around community solar. It was introduced in the House, Michigan House, by a Republican um, and it would create a regulatory framework to allow 
for community solar projects where people can subscribe to a portion of the project, um, have some of that renewable energy credited to their bill, um, and also be able to support a project that's in their neighborhood, in their community. Um, so really, really important bill, um, also introduced on the House side and has yet to hear, get a committee hearing, but um, you know, I think it's it's a it's a great policy and one that we hope to continue to move forward. So I would say with that, I will wrap it up. But I do think there really are some great opportunities in the legislature. Um, you know, once we get through the the sad bloodbath that will be the the budget in the near term. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Next up, we have Bri Brianna with EcoWorks. On deck is Dan Worth. Hi, thank you for uh, allowing us to share and the panelists were very impressive to listen to and, and just we appreciate you putting together this summit for us today. I just wanted to take an opportunity to be able to uh, announce that we are, EcoWorks is very pleased to announce that we've launched a net zero for all starting today or net zero fast campaign. It's a Michigan specific initiative to eliminate carbon emissions while keeping equity and justice front and center. We're currently accepting applications to join our first cohort of net zero heroes. These are organizations that are committed to achieving net zero by 2050 at the latest and taking a few additional actions to promote equitable climate action. We want to know if your organization or municipality is, would like to join us in championing this effort. Contact us and we can point you to many resources. We are actually uh, hosting a webinar next Wednesday, May 13th. I will put some links to be able to share with the organization of how you can join that webinar, where there'll be more informational uh, information put there and resources about um, how the Net Zero Fast campaign will start. We also are starting a crowdfunding, matching crowdfunding campaign that's live on IOB. And if you just Google IOB Detroit, you'll see Net Zero Fast on their list of projects. Or check us out at EcoWorksDetroit.org, Net Zero. We appreciate your support. We look forward to championing climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really great. Next up is Greenworth. The Groundwork Center. Next is Bill Wood with WEMIAC. Hey everybody, uh, Dan Worth with the Groundwork Center up here in Traverse City. Um, our work continues uh, at Groundwork. We focus on energy, mobility, and food. And so recently we pivoted some solar work. We had been doing a crowd raising, a crowd fundraising site towards a local food relief effort, uh, which went great, raised over $160,000, goes to impacted folks in local pantries, and the food is sourced from local farmers. So I think moving forward, a lot of what we're looking at is local energy. How can, when we're on the other side of this, we take the 100% commitments we have in cities like Traverse City and Petoskey and turn those into real world solar projects and efficiency projects with jobs, getting folks employed, especially those in the harder hit uh, rural areas. Um, so that's where our work is pivoting for now. Two specific opportunities coming up. One Kate mentioned a little bit, uh, we're partnering with MyCan on a series of podcasts, all focused on how Michigan as a state can get to uh, net zero. And the overall framework is speaking of resilience, and this will be our first climate and clean energy offering. Um, and the first episode of, episodes of that will come online later this month, so keep an eye out. We'll be pushing them out, as will MyCan, always looking for speakers, uh, stories, and good topics to cover. The idea is to to push forward some of the exciting work you all are doing uh, around the state. Second opportunity, we had to cancel our in-person Mission Michigan uh, Clean Energy Conference. It's a huge bummer, um, but we're pivoting on that too. And on June 22nd, we'll have a deal-making summit where uh, we're getting together installers, financers, attorneys, and then a lot of customers who are looking for energy, mostly efficiency and solar solutions. Um, and we're bringing them together digitally for a day as we were planning to do in person uh, to make deals and refill some of those pipelines that might have been emptied with projects that won't go anymore. Or just, uh, as uh, Frank was saying wonderfully, contribute to this increasing number of jobs around the state that are going forward. So um, look out for announcements about both those opportunities. Regina, great job, great to see you. Uh, shout out to all the panelists. Kate, you're amazing. Uh, thanks all.
Thank you, Dan. Next up, we have Bill Wood with WEMIAC. On deck is Sean McBrady. Hey, everybody. Uh, big shout out to uh, the panelists. Thank you. Uh, same to Kate, Bill, and Allison with MyCAN. Awesome job. And the steering committee, too. I appreciated being a part of it. Um, quick update from West Michigan. Uh, here in Grand Rapids, uh, WEMIAC is part of the Community Collaboration for Climate Change, which is uh, an initiative that's really being led by the city where we're, uh, we're centering equity right at the beginning as we should be to be working on uh, both mitigation and adaptation uh, for the city, you know, at the, the practical level, the policy level. Uh, so really excited to be a part of that. We're planning for about six months before we take a, a big stride in whatever direction the, the team decides to go. Uh, WEMIAC's also involved out on the lakeshore in um, trying to uh, convince the leadership of Grand Haven to not build a, uh, a gas peaker plant to replace their coal plant that has uh, that, that went offline last year. We're working with the Sierra Club on that. Shout out to, to Jan O'Connell and the Sierra Club West Michigan. Uh, and finally, we are working in Holland with a small group of concerned citizens on uh, trying to convince the, the leadership, the Holland City Council, to really invest pretty heavily in their community energy plan uh, to continue to uh, increase energy efficiency programs and to shore up renewables, uh, really electrify everything equitably. So uh, that's a little update from West Michigan. Nice to see and hear everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. It is so great to see all your faces. Um, next up is Sean McBrarity with Clean Water Action and the coordinator of the Oil and Water Don't Mix campaign. On deck is Aaron Ferguson. Hi everybody, um, and yeah, thank you to the panelists and thanks or panelists and thanks to uh, Kate and everybody and Bill and everyone for organizing this today. Um, I'm Sean McBrady with uh, Clean Water Action, based out of Lansing, and um, so I wanted to uh, update everybody on the situation with Line Five. As um, many of you have probably heard, uh, Enbridge is pushing forward with. Uh, application with uh, permit applications to both the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy and Michigan Public Service uh, Commission, despite uh, the COVID outbreak. And um, <clears throat> why this is important is because this is the critical time uh, to be able to uh, kill Enbridge's tunnel application uh, before it really gets moving here. Um, and obviously we can't address climate as a state while we're continuing to build outdated fossil fuel infrastructure, um, especially outdated fossil fuel infrastructure that goes through a five mile stretch of um, really the most vulnerable part of the Great Lakes for an oil spill. Um, so some of the upcoming opportunities we're gonna have, we're gonna have lots of opportunities for public comment. The first one is actually going on right now. And I just put in the chat box uh, a link to where you can participate. Um, so when Enbridge filed their permits with the Michigan Public Service Commission, um, they also had the audacity to claim that their existing easement from 1953 gives them all the legal authority they need, they need to dig a tunnel through the Straits of Mackinac and replace it with a new pipeline. Um, <clears throat> and they asked uh, the uh, Public Service Commission to uh, for a declaratory ruling basically saying, oh yeah, we, the Public Service Commission, have no authority to oversee you uh, digging an oil tunnel through the Great Lakes. So um, if you use this link that I just put in the chat box, it'll take you to our oil and water don't mix uh, action where you can comment to the um, Michigan Public Service Commission asking them to fully review this permit and not to take themselves out of the process uh, here in the beginning as Enbridge is requesting. Um, moving forward, there will be uh, lots of opportunity for public comment as Enbridge works their way through uh, the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy permitting process, um, which uh, just today actually um, Eagle got back to Enbridge on their initial uh, permit request and told them that it was incomplete. Uh, they needed to provide information about um, feasible and prudent alternatives to Line 5, which we know exist. Uh, despite the millions of dollars the oil industry and their allies have spent trying to sell Michiganders on this pipeline, um, we know there are options that don't include oil running through the Great Lakes. And that's what Oil and Water Don't Mix is all about, making sure that we shut down this pipeline and no longer have fossil fuel infrastructure running through the Great Lakes. Um, so please uh, take action on that. It's, uh, the comment period is only open till May 13th. 
We've already had over 1,400 people in the last six days give comment. Um, so I hope everybody on this call will be able to join them. And then moving forward, like I said, there'll be more opportunities for engagement on uh, May 22nd is uh, the first oral arguments in, um, <clears throat> in, uh, in uh, People of Michigan v. Enbridge, which is Attorney General Nessel's case to um, claim that the existing easement for Line 5 doesn't, comp uh, doesn't comply with public trust law and should therefore be considered void. Um, and as of now, the court is planning on uh, airing the hearings live online. So if you follow uh, Oil and Water Don't Mix, um, put yourself on our email list. We'll make sure we have the link going out to that as well so that you can watch the oral arguments in the case and also participate in all the upcoming public comment sessions. Um, we also have to do another quick pitch here for uh, tomorrow night. Um, so we've been doing a series of, um, a series of just uh, Zoom live events um, with uh, some folks from Oil and Water Don't Mix to talk about um, everything going on with Line 5. There's a lot of information and uh, we have our next one coming up tomorrow night at 7.15 p.m. Um, and so if you're uh, interested in that, check out our website. The information is there as well. Awesome. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Sean. Um, next up, we have Aaron Ferguson with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. On deck is Todd Allen. And just a reminder to try to keep your comments to one or two minutes. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for or or organizing this and thanks to all the panelists and, the, and everyone listening for your perseverance in this time. I know it's difficult to uh, continue to think about some of these issues, but it's, it's really important. Um, so at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, uh, the Climate and Health Adaptation Program has been uh, moving forward, uh, building some, some new resources and data sets that will help communities uh, think about the health impacts from climate change um, and also what to do about that. Um, so I will post some, some links in, in the chat box that, that refer you to that. But um, in, in particular, we've been working with the Environmental Health uh, Tracking Program, which is another program within the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to get some uh, climate data up on their environmental health data portal and at that portal, you can also look at different health outcome data, different environmental exposure data, um, and some socioeconomic data. So it's, it's a really good way to think about not only health impacts and climate change, but equity and health disparities as well. And looking forward, we, we've also participated with the state's high water action response team. And we've been preparing at the state level for not only the, the, the rising Great Lakes levels that we're seeing, but the continual flooding that we happen to see around the state, which is, as, as we know, is driven by climate change. And so we're developing some tools around that. Um, and then over the next year, we've been partnering with uh, the Michigan State University School of Planning, Design and Construction and MSU Extension to develop a, a uh, climate health adaptation guidebook that will help communities, especially smaller, more rural communities, think about how to integrate health into their, some of their existing plans and, and, and meet some of the um, obligations to like hazard mitigation planning that they already have to do. So um, I, I will share those resources as they become available. And thank you to all. Thank you so much, Erin. Next up, we have Todd Allen with the fastest path to zero from the university at the University of Michigan and on deck is Charles Griffith. All right, thanks. So we were really happy to be able to host the first uh, fastest path to zero climate in April of 2019. Uh, we were excited to try to do round two this April. Like a lot of folks, we had to defer that um, because of the COVID uh, outbreak uh, to September. Uh, we decided this week that September at the university is likely still going to be kind of complicated. We hope to be wel welcoming students back, but possibly with public health measures that make doing another large summit difficult. So this year, we decided to switch to all digital. Uh, we're going to spread it out over the week of September 14th. Uh, we hope you'll be able to join us, and uh, hopefully then we'll be able to do a big in-person summit again in 2021. Thanks. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Charles Griffith, Director of Climate and Energy Program at Ecology Center, and on deck is Pat Race. 
Thank you. It's really great gathering virtually with everybody today, uh, though I'll certainly miss the uh, happy hour that might follow. Um, as probably most folks know, the transportation sector is now the largest source of climate pollution, having surpassed the power sector a few years back, nationally at least. And of course, that means that one of the most important policies that we need to address emissions from this sector are strong fuel economy and greenhouse gas standards for vehicles. Uh, unfortunately, this is not what the Trump administration did just last month when it promulgated new standards, dubbed the SAFE rule, that roll back a pre the previous and much tougher and safer standards that were set during the Obama, Obama administration. And while um, unfortunately this will result in another 2 billion barrels of oil uh, to be burned, another 900 million metric tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, uh, but also thousands of additional deaths from air pollution, uh, job losses in the auto sector um, from those workers that would have built the more efficient vehicles. Um, and lastly, millions of dollars in additional cost to consumers to refuel those less efficient vehicles rather than keeping them in um, those folks' pockets and in their communities. Put into context, this single action is, is arguably the biggest setback for the country's climate policy under the new administration and is essentially a gift to the oil industry, which seems to be about the only, uh, the only ones that benefit from this rule. So uh, what can we do about it uh, in a few seconds or less? Um, well, certainly there'll be legal action challenging the faulty assumptions and analysis that were used in the rule and that led some of our EPA core staff people, many based here in Ann Arbor, uh, to refuse to allow their names or their logo to be used in the analysis that was used to support the rule. Um, but of course, the other big option is to uh, support uh, a new pro-climate administration to, to the White House in uh, 2021, which could overturn the rule and replace, replace it with something perhaps much stronger. Uh, it's clear, uh, as many have stated, that elections matter and hopefully voters will understand that this fall and make climate a priority going forward. Um, there's obviously other stuff that can happen at the state level, including some of the bills that Charlotte mentioned earlier and other things that maybe we can talk about on a future webinar if folks are interested. But thanks, thanks for having me. Thank you, Charles. And a future webinar on this sounds great to me. Um, next up is Pat Race with the Climate Stick Project and on deck is Jane Vocal. Pat, are you there? Um, oh, now I hear you. So it appears my video is not working, and that's a shame to because the climate stick is such a visual oh. activity. Oh, I am there. Okay. <laughs> so here's the climate stick, and basically it's a way to help people communicate about the climate problem. All you got to do is go to the website, Google for climate stick, and you'll find it given out over 30,000 of these climate sticks. And what we found is high school students are organizing climate stick clubs and we're using Instagram to do that. So please, if you have high school students, the Instagram address is climate underscore stick. The stick itself helps you explain the climate problem in 90 seconds with great detail on our website. George Marshall and Bill McKibben have said the way to break the cone of silence around climate change is to get people to talk about it. Most people don't like to talk about it, but we have techniques to help you do that. The climate stick is the symbol that you remember the mass movement to end the burning of carbon. And we hope someday 80% of the people in the country who need to have us change where we get our energy from will see the climate stick as a way to facilitate discussions. So either find us on Twitter or uh, Facebook or our website. Once again, Google for Climate Stick. And that's about all I got to say. Wonderful, thank you so much. Next up, we have Jane Bogle with the University of Michigan Voices for Carbon Neutrality and on deck is David Hast. 
Hi, thanks so much. What a, what a great sort of demonstration of how much can happen on Zoom. You know, it's like, who needs to jump in their car anymore? So I do want to introduce a group at the University of Michigan, Voices for Carbon Neutrality. It's got its roots in a carbon neutrality conference in the spring of 2018. Uh, we are a voice of faculty and alumni leaders really driving the university, advocating strongly for a carbon neutrality plan that is consistent with the timeline of the IPCC report. As you probably know, there is a presidential commission. It has a good 18 months of uh, work under its belt. Its recommendations will finally be made this fall. A robust structure, lots of uh, resources, uh, coming to bear on the problem. I want to recognize with great respect the, the student-led climate action movement at Michigan and how intuitively and instinctively the students think of climate justice as the flip side of the coin to the climate crisis. And faculty alumni leaders are really coming together with a strong voice. Um, I put our link in the chat room. Um, We've come together, we're really focused uh, on the regions because they ultimately will be the decision-making body. And like all of you know, this is a ground game. We have had 50 speakers at U of M Regents meetings for the last, well, since May of 2019, 2018. Um, 1,400 faculty, over 1,400 have signed a petition. That voice, that momentum, that ground game, it's getting heard. It is absolutely getting heard and having an impact. And, and again, I want to recognize the students who sometimes don't really feel that because of all the inevitable setbacks. Um, I hope, I hope, U of M and I trust, they will come out with a model that is meant to be replicatable and scalable across the state. I hope our policy environment continues to get climate friendly. And I want to give one great big shout out to Missy Stoltz and her leadership in Ann Arbor, the robustness of that climate, the, the, the carbon neutrality plan, and the tough, tough walk it is and all of us make getting folks on board. But the tide's turning and we all need to stay in the game. And we got a couple really critical months and short years in front of us. So game on. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, next up, we have David Hast with the Grand Rapids Climate Action. And then following him is our last update from Elizabeth Hamill Hoffman. Hi, I'm David Hast. I'm with Grand Rapids Climate Action, which is grclimateaction.org. We're uh, just about one year old uh, grassroots group that's working to mobilize people in Grand Rapids and the region to demand strong rapid action on climate. Uh, we'd love to have more people from the Grand Rapids area join our group. Um, please go to grclimateaction.org and there you can read an 18 point call to action for Grand Rapids that we posted last fall. Um, we think you'll like all or most of the proposed actions in it and we'd like to ask you to sign it too, um, both as an individual and for your organization. There's two different ways to sign it. So uh, West Michigan people, let's build a movement and make a strong plan for Grand Rapids and the Grand Rapids region. Um, the ideas we've proposed so far have a lot in common with Ann Arbor's A to Zero initiative, which is a great model for other cities. Um, and for those of us that are, are, have decided to try and act locally and, and get our cities to act uh, a lot faster. Um, Grand Rapids needs to work fast um, and come up with something like that, like Ann Arbor's plan, which uh, I am confident will eventually pass. Again, please check out our call to action at grclimateaction.org. Thank you. Thank you. And last but certainly, certainly not least, Elizabeth Hamill Hoffman with Moms Clean Air Force. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much again for hosting. Um, I'm with um, Moms Clean Air Force. We are a national organization of over a million moms and dads who are fighting for clean air and a healthy climate uh, for the health and safety of our children. In Michigan, we have over 29,000 members. We're always looking for more members. 
Um, you can be moms or dads to join grandparents, aunties. You don't have to be a mom. Um, currently under the cover of COVID, unfortunately, um, this EPA um, under Wheeler is been rolling back uh, a lot of protections for our kids right now. It's been mentioned twice um, that the CAFE standard, which is our car emissions, um, is a current rollback right now. We are putting up petitions right now. We are asking our members to sign them. We're giving opportunities for them to meet with our local officials, um, federal officials, um, and beyond. So we have a bunch of different um, petitions you can do. We call ourselves nap time activists um, because a lot of these petitions takes you about 15 minutes to read through and then you can make your voice known. Um, I also will be testifying on uh, May 20th. Um, they're trying to um, keep, the, I'm gonna be testifying over the proposal to retain the national ambient and air quality standards for particulate matter. Uh, they would like to keep that at what the level it is now, but science is showing us and we want them to use science-based evidence um, to actually make that standard a lot tougher. Um, that is a huge problem for us. And we're also working on a campaign called Wheeler Must Go, hashtag Wheeler Must Go. Um, so we ask people to please um, use that hashtag when talking about climate issues and some of these rollbacks. So thank you for the time and the opportunity to speak today. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for all of the updates. There's, as you can see, there's so much important work happening around our state. And I hope that some folks found other ways that they can get involved. Um, I'm going to share the results of the poll. Thank you to everyone for taking the poll. And that's going to really um, help us as we plan for um, our next steps from the, the Michigan Climate Action Network. If you join us late, this is recorded and we'll be sending out via email a link to the recording. And um, to close out, um, you know, all eyes are on Michigan this year. We're a key state in the presidential election. And as you heard today from Maggie, Michiganders, especially Michigan environmental justice leaders have shaped the, the presidential candidate platforms. Our state has been hit very hard by, by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and our governor has been elevated to be a national leader and because of her strong leadership during this crisis um, and you know before all of this happened our state was really poised to lead on climate change before everything had to be put on the back burner and meanwhile the fossil fuel industry as you've heard from all of these updates and and the attacks on our climate and health have not stopped so as we are working in our to support our communities and those most impacted by this COVID-19 crisis right now, we are also continuing to work for climate justice. We can do both and we really have to. And we're working to make sure our election is fair and decision makers are ready to act on climate. We're working to show strong support for Governor Whitmer to make Michigan a leader, a climate leader, as soon as she is able to. We're working to fight the Line 5 oil tunnel and to support and lift up campaigns led by frontline leaders and local action and communities around the state. And we look forward to working with you on all of this. So I wanna thank again, all of our speakers. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Thanks again to our sponsors and to the steering committee and the planning team. We are going to close out by playing some music from Kalamazoo based musician, Jordan Hamilton and Richard Rothko. Thanks again, and we'll see you again soon. This song right here is about the internal journey. Filtering out all the surface stuff that we go through and focusing on the internal battle. Steady pacing on my meditation Barely racing, trying to get these cycles right To set my base and raise vibrations Up to the sky to get mine And only here to get by I Like to call me when I die They say the finer things in life was on top Cream of dreams defeat All you need is a team With the waist is a Glock I used to live but I thang I fight and took what I need Nothing outside of thee That fell into the dead sea Dream is what they told me The pipes is what they sold me The hope is how they fuel me The lies is what control me So I stay in the 
smoke Objective aim at ropes One thing that this shows Is that you can't destroy hope Perhaps I wonder for the stacks Perhaps I wonder for the raps Perhaps I wonder for the facts What good is that? Instead I hold my moments close Until I reach my destined goals While all my family's living broken Not the burning centuries Jokes To all my family's living broken Not the burning centuries Jokes That's my goal Cause Every day I wake and find my borderline the way to go. Better days, better ways. Every day I wake and find my borderline the way to go. Better days. And Lord forgive me cause I know I ain't perfect Used to only live by greed, now I know it's not worth it Opportunities fall in line with the purpose Only to be dreamed cause the actions of thought Fought the natural workers Note to self, save your health, fall in love with the circus You never seem to go without, so horse out and just work it And I'm tired and I feel in the burn When am I gonna get through hurt and enjoy this? When am I gonna get through hurt and implore this? Feeling of wonder, bring your thunder to your under With the light that strikes the heart to start the comeback of a corpse Shaping new poles like the warp to get the time goes with the fall Break it down and burn the walls and make believe with your thoughts and bring my conscience out from dark. Put sanity to a rest, knowing I'm my best. Yeah, perhaps I'm wonder for the stacks, perhaps I'm wonder for the rats. Knowing me, I'll probably change for stacks as long as I do my craft. It's cool. Knowing me, I'll probably change for stacks as long as I do my craft. It's cool. It's cool. Every day I wake and find my borderline up way to go. Better days, better ways, yeah. Every day I wake and find my borderline up way to go. Better days, yeah. Better days, better ways, better. Say something to the camera, Eddie.